Good morning. Morning. So I'll, I'll wait till it turns 11 and everybody has got a chance to, to join us before I give a briefing and, uh, and say hello properly. But thank you for being early. <laughs> Morning. I think we might have a couple of other people join us. We've got a minute or two, I've got about a minute to eleven o'clock, so relax for the moment. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to try and be prompt with all this. Um, good morning, my name is Mike Grocop. I'm, um, I work down in Southampton and I'm one of the chairs of uh, the EPOM London meeting. Um, thank you very much everyone for um, submitting your posters and for uh, coming along today to uh, do a little presentation and have a little chat. Um, the Format is relatively straightforward. What I'll do is, is stick you on screen share in a moment and I have we have stitched together all your posters into a single PowerPoint presentation. So I've got the screen control. Unfortunately, that means you don't know which order you're coming in. So I'll give you a moment or two once the poster comes up for you to compose yourself um, and get ready to present. And then the, the plan uh, is that you spend a minute or two summarising what's on your poster and I'm not going to there's no penalty if it's a bit longer but but uh, ideally a minute or two so that we can have a enough time for some questions and discussion and then the remaining four or five minutes will be discussion and I'll, I'll probably ask some questions and and please feel free to join in uh, if it's not your poster and ask questions and the only request really is that they're um you know constructive and positive questions rather than critical which i'm, I'm sure everybody would have would have done anyway so i'm going to start by screen sharing uh, if I can. Uh, hold on one second. Actually, I may not be able to share quite yet. But I've just got to, if you bear with me, I've got to make sure the post presentation's open. We're, this is only the second session we've done. So, so along with you, we are learning by doing. So <laughs> bear with us a little bit. I promise we'll definitely be much slicker next year. Uh, and the, so the other thing to say is that we are recording, uh, if that's okay. If it's not okay, please let me know. But we're recording so that we can ideally offer these as uh, make them available on the website subsequently, unless you don't want them to be available on the website. So this should work. Uh, can you confirm to me that you can see? Uh, just a slide of EBPOM, or can you see presenter view? Yeah, that's clear now. So you've just, just got a slide, you haven't got a presenter view with multiple slides? No, just no. a slide. Just a slide. Just a slide. Okay, so uh, welcome to the session. Uh, I think the hopefully the, the rules of engagement are reasonably clear. Um, we, we had a huge number of abstracts submitted, so there are well over 100 abstracts submitted, so we've got a few of these sessions going on uh, Monty Martin and I are doing this in parallel over today and tomorrow. Um, there were um, six poster finalists selected for sort of live presentation during the conference itself and that will happen on Wednesday and Thursday uh, and, th and they're 
eligible for the final prize, but we may have uh, some subsidiary prizes that we can offer to you know, outstanding presentations during these sessions. Uh, and the plan is to put the PDF of your poster and the, the video on the website, unless you ask us not to. So completely fine if you would prefer us not to do that. But uh, in order to you know, give additional exposure, and there are just under 8,000 registrants, I don't know that they'll all turn up. It's a bit, the, the uh, investment in registering to a virtual meeting is somewhat less than a real meeting, but uh, so we're expecting a lot of interest in the meeting and therefore potentially in the posters, which people will be able to access. So just let us know if you don't want either the PDF or the video of your presentation on the website. And just, uh, you know, as with everybody and COVID, uh, we've, we've had to do a lot of changing over the last few months. And one of the things we're doing in taking all our meetings online, we may do parallel face-to-face -face meetings as well, hopefully in the future when we can go back to doing that. But is start to have a, a more coordinated approach between the meetings we have internationally across London, Chicago, uh, Dingle, which is our meeting in Ireland, uh, Las Vegas, and in fact we have one in Hong Kong, which isn't on this list uh, later this year, uh, and start to work towards a sort of CME approach where the, we'll be able to have a, a certificate of perioperative care from the e-learning platform, so a little bit like you see in some of the uh, online uh, providers. So that's the main that's the introduction. Uh, once again, thank you for coming along. And uh, does anybody have any questions about how it will work? Or do you want me to recap what the format is? Or is everybody happy to go? Um, oh. good. Okay. So I will move on to the... Uh, we'll, we'll get more sophisticated with our timing, but at the moment I'm doing it on my phone. <laughs> um, so I'll move on to the first presentation. Uh, I know that not everybody who's got a poster here can definitely come. So if you just, uh, is, are you on the call, Dr. Chips? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, that's me. Great. Bye. Okay. Uh, if you just take a moment to uh, get ready and compose yourself, let me know when you're happy to go and I'll start the clock. Yep, I'm ready. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, Good, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Abhishek. I'm a CC3 um, anaesthetist uh, currently working in UM University Hospital, uh, which is in East London. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about my poster, which is uh, Practical Skills Teaching for Surgeons on the ICU during the COVID-19 pandemic. So a little bit of background. Um, so I'm a trainee anaesthetist um, who was working in theatres um, and along with my surgical colleagues, um, we were uh, all redeployed to the intensive care unit um, because of the uh, pandemic. Um, and um, Newham, as a, as a geographical area, um, has the highest rates of um, COVID-19 in both England and Wales. Um, and this is because of a number of different reasons. Um, social deprivation, um, half the children in Newham live in poverty, um, has a, also has a large BAME, BAME um, uh, community as well. And therefore, we decided to uh, do, uh, develop a teaching program uh, whereby we teach um, our surgical colleagues who were redeployed to the intensive care unit um, uh, basic anaesthetic and intensive care practical skills. Um, and this was done in order to um, release us as anaesthetists and intensivists um, so that we could be uh, able to be, uh, see more patients and deal with other tasks. So there were, in total, there were 16 um, both general surgeons and orthopedic surgeons redeployed to the intensive care unit. Um, and we taught them both, uh, we taught them five different skills. Um, so these were arterial line insertion, central line insertion, um, using the ultrasound uh, to identify blood vessels, um, uh, setting up a ventilator for invasive and non-invasive ventilation, um, and drawing up uh, intubation and emergency drugs. Um, and this was done both um, uh, in simulation so um, using models um, and in situ uh, real time on the intensive care unit. Um, and then we asked, we'd, we gave them a survey, both pre and post redeployment and asked them about their confidence in, able to, in their ability to perform each of these skills, um, either independently um, with supervision or uh, not at all. Um, and the results were actually uh, overwhelmingly quite positive. Um, so the, mo the majority of uh, participants, over 80% were able to form skills such as arterial line insertion um, and drawing up of daily uh, intubation uh, drugs post redeployment. And that, that was a great help for us because as an anesthetist and, and, and intensivist, we were redeployed. We were asked to see patients in any recess on the wards 
on the unit and if the surgeon were able to perform some of these skills for us, it reduced some of the workload for us. Also, um, the surgeons learned some transferable skills, um, such as using the ultrasound and speaking to my fellow registrars um, on, uh, on, the sur on surgery. Um, now, they're able to perform things like peripheral venous cannulation um, without having to call us as anaesthetists, which is obviously great for the workload for us. Um, so, in conclusion, um, uh, the skills that we taught the surgeons um, help them help reduce the workload for us as anaesthetists, but also um, let them learn new transferable skills, um, which was a great help to us. Um, and more, moreover than that, in terms of a sort of perioperative uh, point of view, um, we've developed a lot of uh, resilience. Um, it was obviously a very physically and emotionally challenging time. We've got a great team dynamic um, working with the surgeons now back in theatres. Um, we have a very good relationship and a good rapport with each other and we can call each other for help. We've got each other's mobile numbers um, and we hope that our, our teamwork translates to uh, future improved um, perioperative patient care. Great, thank you. Uh, um, what was the seniority of the surgeons mm -hmm. doing this? So most of the surgeons were um, either SHOs or uh, there were also some registrars. But no, no um, uh, So the, no, the consultants were in charge of running the CPOD list um, and any mm. other emergency um, theatres going on. Um, uh, so on, the only, uh, the, re the redeployed surgeons were um, surgeon uh, registrars and uh, SHOs. Okay, good. And um, and di did you, I mean, this is a sort of softer question, but did, obviously you were teaching them these specific skills. Sure. D did they bring something to you as part of the teaching of that? Because, you know, surgery being a very practical, like anesthesia, very practical specialty. So one one thing um, I actually did learn, for, for example, is um, t uh, using surgical knots. So I was never confident in when suturing um, arterial lines and central lines. I had no idea. I was just doing whatever knot I, what I learned. But they actually very helpfully taught me the surgical knot. So I can now do a one-handed um, uh, suture, which is actually a speed up my suturing as well. So that's, that's a great help for them. Very good. Uh, and, and any questions from, from the others on the call? Don't worry if not, if you're nervous about your presentation or, or otherwise. So to, uh, uh, presumably um, next time, uh, let's be honest, let's, if there's another surge, I'm not being deliberately pessimistic, but I think it's not unlikely. Um, if that comes to Newham, it will be a different set of surgeons and a different set of anaesthetic genius quite likely. How have you, how have you made this sustainable beyond the current group of trainees? So one of the one of the things we'll uh, likely do is we'll we'll um, we'll advise the uh, the lead the clinical leads that actually this system worked really well. So we'll ensure that the um, the simulation prior to redeployment was uh, there in the future, um, and we'll make the the new surgeons who are uh, possibly redeployed make them aware that they will be learning some of these skills again in the future. So we'll ask them to, you know, look online, look at how videos about how to do these things and read up more about, for example, setting up a ventilator. They can read a little bit about, um, you know, uh, IPAP, EPAP and all these things for non-invasive ventilation, just just so you can get get an idea. Um, and then when they're in there, uh, in the, on the intensive care unit, they can sort of perform these skills with more knowledge uh, than they probably would have had without any prior reading or anything. Great, thank you very much. Uh, you might not have heard it, but the little alarm went off a couple of moments ago. So, um, okay. all, all done. thank you. Uh, the next presentation is this one. Is uh, Dr. Wood on the call? So this may be. I think this is Adam Wood who did let us know that he may not be able to join for family reasons. So uh, that will be why that is. Uh, Dr. Afzal. Hi there. Hi. Uh, take a couple of moments to compose yourself, get ready if you want, uh, and just let me know when you're happy to go ahead and present. Um, right, I'm happy. Thank you. Uh, hi there, so I'm Ask Afzal clinical fellow from the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Uh, our poster is based on an audit about the incidence of 
transfusion, because your lung blind body fusion. In this audit, we basically investigated the incidence of transfusion in anemic versus non-anemic patients, uh, anemia being HB of 130 and above as per the international consensus statement. Our pre-operative clinic works to identify and optimize anemic patients. So 59 cases were reviewed, out of which about 32%, i.e. 19, were anemic, and seven of these were referred to the MDT. 16% uh, of anemic patients were transfused compared to just 10% of non-anemics and uh, all of the anemic patients who were referred to MDT avoided transfusion. Concluding that uh, optimization of anemia before surgery reduces incidence of blood transfusion and results in better patient care. So after this, our aim is basically to educate surgeons and colleagues on new anemic guidelines, uh, review our MDT pathway, uh, remind pre-assessment team to review about anemia, and then re-audit this and see how things are after that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. When did you, um, at what point in the pathway to surgery did you identify that they were anemic? And um, how, how close to surgery? So we have uh, the anemic pathway whenever a patient comes in. Uh, according to that pathway, the target HB should be 130 and above, uh, preferably above that. And uh, if we think that uh, they don't meet the criteria, then we have a very good pathway. Uh, and then we go on to further investigations. And then we, so according to this pathway, we have to refer the patients to the anemia MDT. So when the patient comes in, basically. I guess my question is more about the, the timing of that, as in, you know, how, how much time did you manage to make yourself available or, make, you know, have available in order to do things preoperatively? Was it a week or six weeks or three months or? Uh, so that's about two, two to six weeks. Okay. Yeah. And did, how did you identify them? Were they identified at pre-op clinic or could you, could you identify them when they were first screened, when they were first listed for surgery? So in the pre-assessment clinic, we identify them when they are reviewed before surgeries. Okay, thank you. A any questions from other folk on the call? So I'll, I'll jump back in. Um, and this, this is, a, a, this is ex exclusively for posterior lumbar body Fusion, is that right? Yes, because we are a spinal center, uh, we are a neurology center, so that's why we assess them. The aim is basically to go on identifying at the booking for surgery. And this audit is particularly just for spinal, spinal patients. And are you, do you have ambition to uh, extend to other patient groups within the National Hospital? Uh, definitely, yes, we do. Uh, we, we do plan to do that. Thank you. And so what, uh, we've done a little bit of this in Southampton as well. What, how did your surgeons take it? Were, were they positive about it initially or, you know, what, what was that journey like? Um, so most of our uh, surgeons are quite happy because uh, end of the day, everyone's aiming for betterment of patient care. So we, we've had quite a positive response. But, so now, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested because of our own experience when they were quite there was a degree of reluctance early on because it sounded complicated to, to you know make sure the blood test happened and make sure it got sent and in fact I'm sure your experience is it's not that complicated but uh but once we did it they were very enthusiastic in fact they got very cross if we couldn't do it yeah sort of similar yes yeah, sort of similar good um, and, and beyond anemia optimization are, you, uh, are there other things that you are looking to uh, optimized before surgery for this patient group? Um, so it depends on what the patient presents with, but particularly anemia and then diabetes, because diabetes plays quite a key role in uh, post-op wound care and how early the patient recovers. So that is something we are quite particular about here as well. With, with HbA1c measurements or...? or... It's we, we do tend to do that as well. Right. And, and how are you, uh, 
so note your last line of your conclusions, we propose to educate surgeons and anaesthetists, uh, both of which can be a challenge. <laughs> um, under some circuit. How are you going ahead with, with doing that? How are you achieving that? Uh, so after this audit, we are going to re-audit and see how things how things basically happen. But what we are going to do is we are going to keep on reminding our pre-assessment team to review anemia and educate them uh, as to the long-term effects of them that anemia can have and particularly if the patient undergoes transfusion. Then uh, they are, it has been known to have quite a lot of complications later on. So if they're aware of that, then uh, we're quite sure that they would be more particular about anemia. And have you had an opportunity to present, excuse me, have you had an opportunity to present this data in the uh, in MD, in multidisciplinary team meetings? Uh, not yet, but we are definitely planning to do that. It's, it's just because of COVID crisis, things got delayed. But we do have, uh, usually we have weekly audit meetings in which we present all of our data and then we keep on, keep the learning process going on. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so this is the next one, Dr. Harvey. Hi. Uh, same with others. So take a moment if you want to uh, get ready and then just let me know when you'd like to start. Yeah. So I'm ready. Great. Okay, so, so hi, I'm Eleanor Harvey. I'm uh, an anaesthetic registrar uh, currently doing a UPT perioperative medicine fellowship at the Marsden. Um, I'm actually presenting two posters today, so that's why I was just shuffling my papers. Uh, so this uh, is uh, a presentation um, about uh, a project that we've done, a sort of peri-COVID project. Um, in that, um, due to the pandemic, we have set up remote pre-assessment. Um, because of our patients, obviously, um, a lot of them being on the shielding list, um, we've been trying to reduce our traffic to the hospital. Um, so um, these patients have been assessed over the telephone and also we have a remote um, workforce as well. So actually it's, it's, it's worked well together. Um, and what we wanted to look at was whether our outcomes of surgery, um, really our, our cancellation rates and cancellation reasons were comparable to this time last year. Um, and we found that actually um, there was a slightly higher increase in uh, cancelled surgeries this year uh, in that it's 12.5% uh, compared to 10.6% last year. Um, but actually removing the cases that were cancelled for COVID reasons, the numbers are actually very comparable. So it becomes comparing 10.6 to 10.8 this year. Um, and that's actually um, taking into account that this has been set up um, remotely. We've had, because it's part of a cancer hub, so we're doing a lot of non-Marsden patients um, and actually a, a shorter assessment window as well. Um, but, but actually the, the, the two cancellations are, are comparable and you can see in the graphs um, to, the, to the right. Great. Uh, and have you, is that, have you finished the presentation? You're happy? happy yeah, sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't prepare <laughs> much more to present. I thought I would. Yeah, no, that's perfect. The, yeah. um, and when you're talking about cancellations, these are uh, pre assessment cancellations as opposed to day of surgery cancellations. So, for, yeah, so these are all cancellations. Um, and then we have gone through the data further, which it actually isn't on this poster, but we have gone through further and looked at whether they were cancelled day of surgery, 24 hours, 48 hours, or more than 48 hours. Um, and uh, just trying to look at that because um, the, interestingly, it, it, uh, for medical reasons, um, for patients being canceled, so for example, not being fit or needing further workup, um, actually these were, this was slightly increased, but these were more than 48 hour cancellations. They weren't day of surgery. Um, and actually, um, our numbers sort of with, with a shorter time frame were related to other reasons, um, obviously the COVID cases, um, and, but, but they weren't necessarily the medical reasons. But, but we have looked into that further, but I, I haven't, we haven't put it in this poster. Because you can see them as quite opposite, you know, a, a, an early appropriate cancellation with discussion with the patient, yeah. the positive outcome, whereas a day of surgery is almost always a... Yeah, so actually the, day, the, the, the four day, of, in, in 2020, the four day of surgery cancellations... Um, one was that the swabs weren't back, 
Um, one was that there was a change in treatment plan. One, it actually doesn't say, and one was a surgeon was away. So none of it was um, sort of pre-assessment related um, on the day of surgery. Yeah. yeah. Um, and any questions from other folk on the call? Oh, yeah, Eleanor, if you don't mind, I've got a question um, out of curiosity. So with the remote pre-assessment clinics, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Lena, I'm a consultant in Eastis from Perth. Uh, great, great work up with, with the way you've done the remote pre-assessment. And I'm just curious to know, well, with this, uh, did you then sub-analyze to see, you know, were there cancellations on day of surgery with regards to sort of communication errors, so communication errors or unfasted, yeah. you know, patients are face-to-face -face to receive this information? We have to, and we're actually going to publish that in something else. This was kind of uh, early, early um, data collection, and then we, we, that's, we're going to take that further. But yeah, we are looking at relations with timing of the actual cancellation, um, looking at the, um, the, we're grading the surgeries using the, the NICE guidelines um, to see if comparing like to like, because actually um, the Marsden, along with a few other trusts in London, have become cancer hubs. So we're actually bringing in patients from other centres, and some of them are um, high, very high risk surgeries that we, we haven't done before. So we want to check that we are comparing like with like. So we're going to look into that ASA scores, although they're not always reliably recorded. Um, so we are we are looking further into sort of comparisons. But this is only six weeks. Um, and actually, as it's sort of taken off, it, again, it would be interesting to look at the next the next block. Because obviously, it's been sort of three months now, or three and a half months. I've got, I've got one additional question, which it's a bit of a personal obsession, but the um, if you're doing this remotely, presumably you're, you're more potentially more flexible in terms of timing and that, that kind of thing. And how have you looked at doing it earlier in the in the patient journey to surgery? So rather than, say, a few days before doing it as early as possible after the, the notional moment of contemplation. As in, have we considered pre-assessing them sooner? Yes, or, or is it or is it actually done pretty soon? That, that would that would be the dream, but um, and actually my other poster is talking about that. But just unfortunately, the way the referrals to the cancer hub has worked, we have had significantly shorter work up time. It's been it's been very short, um, which 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 has been difficult to work work with. But um, that's why we're, we're quite pleased in our initial six weeks that, that things are comparative. Yeah. I mean, that, I'm sure you have, but I mean, that's that's must be worth feeding back to the the regional cancer networks and um, and the like, because that, that's a potentially a, a a harm from something which ought to be beneficial. What from the sh it being such a short? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's happening, and that's it's going to delay surgery. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Okay, okay the next one, uh, Doctor Byrne. Hello, that's me. Hi. Uh, when you're ready, please let me know. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you. Hi there, so my name's Sarah O'Byrne and I'm a fourth year medical student from the Hull York Medical School. And this project is from York Teaching Hospital. So our project was looking at the York Surgical Enhanced Protocol, which has been used since 2015 to target hemodynamic management in high risk elective colorectal surgical patients. So the arterial lines are used on the ward in the nurse enhanced unit and they detect hypertension and raise lactate and enable you to follow the protocol shown in figure one to give fluid and inotropes as the patient would need. So in this patient, in this study, we just wanted to see how the arterial line um, information impacts on the management of the patients in the first 24 hours post-operatively. So how we did this was a retrospective audit. So we collected the notes from 59 patients and we looked through for the observation charts from the arterial lines and we looked for four things. So we looked for incidence of hypotension, which we defined in this study as less than 65 a map. We had incidence of raised lactate, so more than or equal to 3.0 whether the protocol was triggered, and if it was, what was given. So we found that we collected data for 59 patients, and 92% of those that were hypertensive and 100% of those that had raised lactate triggered the protocol. 37.5 of those with raised lactate were not actually hypotensive, so these may have been missed on the intermittent non-invasive methods that had been used before. Um, 
and we found that 39% received fatty suppressors, 66% received fluids, and 36% received both. 10% of their 59 patients had issues with their arterial lines, which led to shorter lengths of follow-up. And this wasn't always clearly recorded in the notes as to the reason why. So in conclusion, we found that arterial lines can be used on the nurse enhanced unit and allow you to detect hypertension and raise lactate outside of critical care areas. And this is especially important in those that are normotensive, but have raised lactates so and would have been missed, as I mentioned before, by the non-invasive methods. So we found that it allowed NEU to carry out level two monitoring of patients and initiate a protocol should they need to escalate to HDU or critical care. And it's good for high risk patients that have been identified by the CPEP scoring system to potentially relieve bed spaces in HDU. So that's all I've got. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so just in terms of context, you, so you have a surgical HDU and then the, the nurse enhanced unit is a level below that, but a level above the wards, is that correct? Yes, it is. So there's the NEU, which is a bed space of eight. So there's one patient in that eight beds that can use the arterial line. So they're very heavily monitored by the nurses and all the staff on there. And it is, as you say, between the higher level critical care and the lower ward level. Okay, and, and so only one patient on there that can have our arterial line or everyone? Yeah, just, one. Uh, just the one, yeah. Okay, and uh, so I mean the, the results are impressive in terms of the abnormality being identified and in general something being acted upon. It, what, it Was there a degree of automation in the, so was the identification easy because there was a flashing light and an alarm going off or was this attention of the nurses just, just you know good attentive care? Um, because I did this as a retrospective audit and I am a student, I wasn't actually there at the time, so I don't really know, but all I can say is that from when we were looking at the observation charts, they, it was being noted all the time when there was hypotension and then it was able to go for review, but I couldn't tell you about the flashing lights, sorry. No, no, sure, <laughs> thank you. And any questions from other uh, folk on the call? So I've got plenty more, don't worry. <laughs> um, do, do you know, and I accept that you weren't there, but do you know, in order for an intervention to happen, did they have to get a doctor involved or was it nurses acting independently? So abnormality, they could give a fluid or an inotrope? Um, again, I'm not particularly sure, but I know the nurses are very well trained in that unit. So they're very aware of the arterial lines and how they're fitted and everything. Um, I think it was the F1 and F2s that then give the inotropes or the fluids. Um, but I think the nurses were very good at telling them kind of when that needed to be done. Um, and should they have needed to move to HDU, a senior review was organised pretty quickly, so they could do that. Um, it was also quite interesting that there was no actual increase in unplanned admissions to HDU compared to when all these patients would have initially just been sent to HDU anyway. So they were effectively managed on the enhanced unit through through this escalation policy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and I apologise if I keep asking you questions that you can't. Do, do you know, do you have any impression as to how the you know it's obviously nurse led care in some respects. Do you know how the nurses do, do they are they enjoying that professionally or any any feedback at all? Do you know? Um. So I've met one nurse I can talk about, um, and she's the specialist nurse in the authors as well. Um, she has enjoyed having the extra kind of responsibility and she feels very well trained to do so. I think in York, there's quite a close knit team. So she feels very supported by doctors, whether they're seniors or F1s or anything. Um, so they do quite like that responsibility. Right, good. I mean, it's a very, very interesting approach uh, to care. Um, Please say hello to Jonathan, who I, who I know well over many years. I know he's now retired, but um, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next presentation is Dr. Zhang. Yeah, can you hear me, Mike? Um, it's first time using this technology. Yeah, I've got you loud and clear. I think it looks oh, like everybody else is nodding, so everybody can hear you. So uh, feel free to take a moment just to... Uh, uh, compose yourself or whatever and just let me know when you'd like to start. Brilliant, no problems. I'm happy to kick off. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm chairing, I'm currently working as a specialty doctor up in NHS Fife, and I did this teaching project with um, Neil Shaw, who's one of our anaesthetic consultants and works in the high risk clinic. So the University of St Andrews got in touch with us and told us that they'd quite like to send along some medical students every week to watch and learn what we as anaesthetists do in pre-assessment and they would be there for half a day. So we thought this would be really quite an excellent opportunity for students to get involved and to get an introduction to perioperative medicine, what it's all about and what we do. So the central idea behind this teaching which we developed is that the students get to follow and interact with a patient each and they would get to see the entire process through the eyes of the patient as the patient themselves interact with all members of the multidisciplinary team. So what we aim to do during the course of the day was to provide some structure to all of this. So we sent out some pre-reading for the students beforehand, which gave them a bit of an overview to the pathway. And on the morning of the day, we showed the students a video which introduced the process and we introduced some key concepts to them, such as enhanced recovery and shared decision making. And then we had the opportunity to discuss with them the case of a high risk patient, which gave them an opportunity to really think about some of the things that they'd already read. And we also tackled how you might go about taking a history, examining the patient and what investigations you might think about doing. Most of the day was spent in pre-assessment clinic itself. So the students got lots of hands-on experience, lots of practice, getting to speak to patients, putting everything that we've discussed into practice. And at the end of the day, we all got together for a debrief, which was a really good opportunity for the students to discuss their own unique experiences. And we would, off, off this, um, do some quite impromptu teaching based on whatever came up um, you know, that they had experienced over the course of the day. And it was also a really good opportunity for the students themselves to share with each other the experiences that they had had um, of the different patients that they had seen having diff various different surgeries. And I think the students found that quite valuable. We sent out electronic feedback forms to all the students, um, as well as written feedback forms on the day. And the feedback which we have received has been very positive and students have all really enjoyed this way of learning. Um, particular areas which students have highlighted in the, in the white space answers are that they've really enjoyed being able to interact with patients, speak to patients and their families, have opportunities for hands-on learning, um, as well as being able to work with so many different members of the team. So what we're looking at at the moment is whether we might be able to take this further in the future. Um, and include a similar process for the day of surgery itself. So students would get to again see what happens on the day of surgery following on from the pre-assessment process. Thank you. Thank you, great. Um, so it, these sort of questions always come up when there's a survey involved. What, so your response rate was 17 out of 48. So this that, was that, for the electronic feedback forms that St Andrews, the University of St Andrews sent all of their students an electronic feedback form Right. We actually focused um, not so much on a scoring scale, we focused more on white space responses to try and, um, you know, gauge, um, to gauge how, how um, students found the session as well as to try and improve the session. So we yeah. got a separate set of um, written responses, which was much higher than that. But in terms of the actual looking at the, I guess, discrete figures that we got, um, we got 17 responses from the 48 participants in terms of the electronic forms that were sent out. So the, accepting that there might have been a bias because there were lots of people who didn't answer, but the quantitative data is very supportive of the approach. That's right. And, and did, was it, is it a single day or did, did, so each student has one, one shot or do they, is there, is there multiple experiences per student? So this happens on a weekly basis. We have four students a week um, and each student is attached to an individual patient during that week and it has been um, running throughout the term. So we've had in total 48 students, but four students come every week. So it's been running for several weeks now. So that they each get one go, one, one they each get They each get one go with one patient and the whole session lasts half a day. Great, uh, any questions from others on the call? Yeah, did, did, the, um, did the students highlight any ways to improve the programme in any way? 
Um, yeah, thanks for that, Abhishek. They, they did. So we have been modifying our teaching program along with the feedback that we've got as we've gone along. So one of the things the students mentioned was that sometimes they would have some idle time um, when patients went off for investigations, like they were having an ECG, then students might have a bit of time um, to themselves. So to counter this, what we did was we actually introduced a workbook, which we gave to students at the start of the day. And we had a couple of case-based discussions, you know, based on that at the debrief. And these focused on certain topics such as anemia in the perioperative setting. And it gave students some time to think about these, jot down some thoughts and answers, which we would then come to discuss at the end. And did you get any feedback from patients at all? So some patients did mention that they actually felt more relaxed and more at ease um, having a medical student there and having somebody that they could just speak to make, made them feel quite a lot less anxious about the process. So we did have some patients come and tell us that, which was quite encouraging. Any adverse feedback or all, all pretty positive? Um, I think there are very few patients that didn't want to get involved, which was absolutely fine. But the patients that were keen um, were all quite happy with um, having a student with them. And we did obviously ask them all at the start of the day whether that would be um, something they would be happy to have. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. OK, the next one uh, is... Dr. Remedios. Hi, so it's, uh, it's Lena Negapen here. I'm presenting uh, this poster. Uh, hi, Lena, sorry. <laughs> okay, when you're ready, um, let me know. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm ready. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so my name is Lena. I'm a consultant anaesthetist. I'm from uh, Perth, Western Australia. Um, and um, so my poster is called uh, Building the Urgent Surgical Capacity in a Satellite Hospital uh, During the COVID-19 Outbreak. And just to give you an Australian um, perspective of it. So Western Australians, we enjoy access to one of the best um, healthcare systems in the world. The um, COVID outbreak, it threatened the provision of such, uh, such a healthcare system uh, just by reading international reports of how healthcare systems were being overwhelmed overseas. Um, so our center, uh, the Fiona Stanley Fremantle Hospital Group, we have a tertiary subspecialist um, hospital and a satellite um, hospital, um, both of which are, you know, have different, very different functions. Um, and the uh, satellite hospital pretty much functions at a 95% um, you know, elective service, most of it day surgery model, uh, low to intermediate risk surgery. So the, during the wide, um, widespread outbreak overseas, we anticipated that we may need to move some of the services from the tertiary hospital to our satellite services so that um, we could make space um, at our tertiary hospital to allow ICU surge capacity, um, as well as I think our, our primary concern was just allowing um, access to theatre for um, emergency cases um, in Western Australia. And that's what we were trying to um, maintain. So once we obtained um, approval from the hospital executives, uh, we formed a perioperative working group uh, with all the major stakeholders, um, as mentioned um, in the right corner of the poster. So these are the members of a working group that was formed very um, early um, in this project. And we identified tasks um, you know, and designated them to the to the different, um, the different um, stakeholders in, the, in this group. Um, yes, examples of the tasks that we, we identify at this point would be uh, things like, how are we gonna create a COVID-free hospital? How are we gonna uh, screen every entry point, uh, every patient, every visitor? How are we going to select our cases and um, you know, provide the reconfiguration of outpatient services? Um, and also we had to acknowledge the dormant phase of the infection, the asymptomatic phase. So how are we going to pick out the patients and manage patients who unexpectedly develop COVID symptoms um, while they're an inpatient in our satellite hospital? Um, so these were the things that we had to, um, to look into and focus on during our uh, project. Um, so we enjoyed working in a very highly um, energetic um, environment, as I suppose is um, you know, all over the world at the, at the beginning of the outbreak. Uh, the project was successful. We managed to provide theatre search capacity up to 100% um, of our pre-COVID um, theatre services. Um, we were quite pleasantly surprised um, because um, our improved um, efficiency was in fact seen 
in managing our the most vulnerable patients, the uh, the fractured neck of femur, uh, where our original time to theater um, data was pretty impressive, um, you know, national compared to national and international published data. But then during this outbreak, um, performing these patients at the surgery in the satellite hospital actually achieved a uh, better time uh, to theater than we've ever seen before, which was um, quite quite a pleasant surprise for us. Um, and um, and also we we were quite happy that um, we provided a 23% surge capacity in our satellite hospital bed space, uh, which we never had to open because we were quite blessed in the way the outbreak was controlled um, quite early. Great, thank you. Uh, my first question is probably slightly off piece, but what time is it there? <laughs> oh yes, that's right. I was going to say good evening, but yeah, it's pretty late in the evening, so we're close to seven o'clock now, Mike. Okay. <laughs> <It's just> um, <laughs> So thank you for the presentation. Um, what it, uh, just for us to put it into context, what, uh, how much COVID is there in general where you are? Uh, we hardly saw any um, community transmission in Western Australia. Um, we were able to contact trace almost everyone. We had a few crises with the cruise ships showing up at our ports and we had to manage those patients. Uh, but generally um, pretty, uh, pretty controlled now, so yeah. I think I think we might be quite envious of your experience in that regard. Um, and and who, so you you uh, in Fiona Stanley obviously you're trying to make a COVID free hospital. Where did all the COVID patients go? That's this is presumably a system wide uh, innovation. Correct. Yes. So if Fiona Stanley Hospital was designated to be the COVID hospital for Perth in WA. Um, however, I think at very early. Uh, part of the outbreak, we realized that it was just impossible to designate a hospital to take these patients because they were showing up at all the emergency services that we had open. Um, so then all hospitals had to upscale the services and be prepared to receive the patients. So that plan changed very quickly. But what we had control over was in hospitals such as our satellite hospital in Fremantle, where we had no emergency um, department. So this was a controlled environment. Uh, where we had to upscale a lot of services to allow emergency surgery. Thank you. Uh, and any questions from others on the call? Uh, so I've, I've got another question. Um, one of the challenges for us, I think arguably the biggest challenge, was not getting through the first surge. And, and this does depend a lot on where you were in the UK. But, but the bit afterwards, when everybody was already pretty tired after having invested a lot of time and energy into the COVID response, and now we're trying to maintain that, at least to a degree, and get other services going. I just wonder, have you had a similar experience in the sort of aftermath, a degree of fatigue and, and people struggling a bit in the aftermath of the initial surge? Um, definitely. I, I can see that, you know, that initial energy you know, sort of slowly wavering off. Um, however, I must say our peak was nowhere near you know, comparable to what uh, we've seen from European American, um, you know, numbers. So uh, we had a high level of stress just in anticipation. We, we felt like we prepared for a storm that never came in WA. Our Eastern state colleagues are a bit more, uh, you know, a bit more hammered than us, but um, we, we definitely, uh, we, it's exhausting, I think, because in anticipation, you do, you know, work up and you do put up a lot of, um, you know, all those constant guidelines and protocols being rolled out and, you know, email traffic. And, but yeah, that's all died down now. Uh, we're quite eager to get back to, you know, business as usual. Right. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences and for, uh, for dialing in late in your day. Um, my pleasure. <laughs> okay. So the next one is... Um, I'm guessing it's not Dr. Wills. No. <laughs> it's, uh, it's me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm presenting to you, so um, I won't, well, I will introduce myself again. So I'm Eleanor, one of the Registrars and Perioptive Medicine Fellows at the Marsden. This poster is um, describing very much the project I was involved in pre-COVID. Um, and it's talking about a uh, pathway called Summit. Uh, which we set up in uh, September 2019, um, which was basically uh, creating a new perioperative pathway for the high risk upper GI patients. Uh, Summit is, stands for a systematic multidisciplinary management investigation and intervention. Um, but effectively, it is um, something that we set up to basically change the pathway. So um, 
in a lot of Ed Bond conferences, we talk about changing the pathway. Um, and we focus particularly on this, this patient group because they have the, um, the period quite often of chemotherapy or, and they have the period before where they might have a staging laparoscopy. So they're, they're, they're a group of patients that we have time to, to play with. So um, the, the principle was to, to recreate the pathway where we see patients earlier and optimize them sooner. Um, and also to have week, uh, two weekly, sorry, MDT meetings uh, with the upper GI surgeons, anaesthetists, and also involving um, the teams which are involved in our prehab program, which is the physios and the dietitians. We've got a separate prehab program called the Mile, which, which fits into um, this and another cancer tumor group at the moment. Um, and it's been a success. Um, we've had a, a period at the beginning of this year, obviously COVID related, where it, it was sort of disrupted, but it's, it's back up again. Um, and uh, comparing our patient outcomes, so based on cancellations, to what we had pre-summit, um, the, the year prior to summit, so from September 18 to August 19, we had um, 60 patients, but 15 of them were postponed. And looking back at the data, uh, five of them were actually, could have been sort of modifiable. If, we, if we'd seen them earlier in the pathway, they, we believe we could have um, not postponed them. And looking at our data um, with our summit patients, the nine months data that we have, so far we've had 58 patients. Um, 30 of these have been into our prehab program as well, into the mile program. And uh, we've had no, no one postponed so far. 31 patients have gone through their surgery. Um, and also we had quite interesting, we had, because um, when we see these patients early in the pathway, um, in terms of their um, exercise ability, they're either starting with a shuttle walk um, in, in the um, surgical clinic, or we do a, a, a shuttle walk in our sort of assessment, or, or a CPEP, but we, we can see that actually at two patients, we've had success stories in that their CPEP significantly changed from the start of um, joining Summit in the mile to, to, to where they were deemed probably wouldn't have had surgery, but, but, but they did get through and they had surgery. Um, so overall, um, we, we feel that, that, that Summit has been a success um, improving multidisciplinary decision-making and, and patients are having improved outcomes. That's Great, thank you. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the so the mile is is uh, is exercise, nutrition, psychology. Yeah. And yes, yes. So that was so. There's lots of projects, but the mile was set up separately. Um, it's my um, my integrated lifestyle exercise program, um, yeah. and that's the, the the quadruple the the prehab, the um, nutrition, anemia, and psych support. That started in a um, in a gynae cancer group. Um, but that's been brought to Summit, um, and Summit's just up a GI. So we've sort of combined two projects because they're effectively uh, bo both improving the outcome, both optimizing patients, um, and, and the space for it in the pathway. And so if someone turned up with un, uh, new respiratory or cardiac problems, they, they would also be identified and sent off on a different, you, you've got processes in place for that as well. Yeah, sorry, for, um, for going, going, no, so they had yeah. a dysrhythmia or... Yeah, so, so because, we, because we meet with the surgeons early and we even talk about patients that um, might not even have had their staging laparoscopy yet, patients are already identified. So, um, and the surgeons do have some information. They don't have a huge amount of information on the patient, patient's medical history, but they have some. So patients that are identified in those... MDTs, we'll see them early um, and we will, we've, we've got that, that eight week window to refer them. And, and quite often it is because of the type of patients they are, um, it is often cardiology referrals and, um, and, and, and other modifiable risk factors for them as well. Great. A any questions from others on the call? I think this is the last poster, so it's your last chance to ask a question. <laughs> Okay, so I um, 
what one thing I wonder were any that so that you know one of the other aspects of, of pre optive care we talk about is the shared decision making as, mm -hmm. as a consequence of your early evaluation were any patients you know appropriately after discussion did they choose a different path than surgery or did everybody end up following the surgical path um that's good because I have to look at that data um so when we see people, I, I can tell you the numbers, when we see people in uh, our summit pre-assessment, these patients don't necessarily have a surgical date. Um, so yeah. it's, uh, it's not always with, with an end point of surgery, um, but it's certainly not uh, the, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's difficult. I haven't actually got that data to, to say to you, but yes. Um, but yeah. it's, it's, uh, well, I guess what I'm asking, some of those may appropriately have been after discussion gone off on a yeah, 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 it certainly has happened, yeah, but we wouldn't deem that as a cancellation, yeah. No, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that, I think, is the last presentation. Um, can I just check that everybody who's dialed in has had their opportunity to present and we haven't messed up on the organisation at all? This may be good. Um, so, listen, I um, really appreciate you taking the time, particularly those of you taking unusual times to join us. Um, Thank you very much for the presentations, all, all really good. Um, I hope you get a chance to join us next week. The uh, pre-recorded lectures will be online uh, from Saturday morning, and then EBPOM will be on the usual timetable over Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, with the Poets Day on Tuesday, Pure EBPOM Wednesday, and then the joint day with the CPOC, the Centre for Preparative Care on Thursday. So I hope you manage to join in, and there, there are various opportunities to engage in other things around that that will become clear during the week. Um, including a bit of music <laughs> out of house uh, and uh, around the world over Thursday night into Friday morning, we're going to continue with sessions through the East Coast of North America, West Coast, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, and then back to the UK. So uh, I hope you get an opportunity to join to at least some of that. But thank you very much for joining and for your presentations and um, you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Man. Thank you. Thanks.